Podcast Network Asia. Welcome to She Talks Peace, a podcast that highlights the role of women peace builders around the world in bringing lasting peace and security to communities, eavesdrop on their communities, and get to know their stories. From the Philippines to Malaysia, from Indonesia to Palestine, from Myanmar to the United States, their dreams and hopes for a world without violence and a world where every woman and girl can be whoever she wants to be. Hosted by Amina Rasul Bernardo, President of the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy. This is She Talks Peace. Hello, hello. Salam, my dear listeners. Welcome to another episode of She Talks Peace. I'm Amina Rasul of the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy, joining you from Manila. Today, my dear friends, is day 611, 611, of the war waged by Russia against Ukraine. Over 600 days of destruction viewed daily by the world until it's almost like a normal occurrence, like hot days in summer and expected blizzards in winter. Fatigue seems to be setting in among those who are seeing the bombardment of uh, Ukraine on a daily basis. And now the war waged by Israel against Palestine, the daily bombings of the Gaza Strip in retaliation for the attack of uh, Hamas against Israel and the hostaging of Israelis is taking attention away from what's happening in uh, Ukraine. You know, I'm I'm sure uh, the Russian president, uh, Putin, is probably gleeful about Uh, that. And of course, um, the United States, uh, the Congress, finally were able to elect a new speaker, um, a representative Johnson, who has been against uh, funding Ukraine's war effort. He fully supports Israel and may guide the Republican majority to take away the funding that's being proposed uh, for Ukraine and instead just funnel it to Israel. The world is uh, rather depressing when you listen to uh, news and uh, see what's uh, what's going on uh, all over. We kept hoping that uh, that you, you know you, the Ukrainians who have been uh, really coming up with a strong um, repulsion, you know, repulsing the the attempts of um, Russia to annex parts of it. We keep hoping that you know the little victories would be sufficient so that Russia would really halt. But um, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be happening, and winter is coming. The, you know, Ukraine is really going to need all the help that it can get. What's going to happen? The West, the allies uh, of the United States are all uh, upset and worried about uh, the situation of Israel. So all of this, of course, uh, takes its toll on support that could be given to other countries that are in need. So I thought that perhaps today we could revisit Ukraine and talk about a friend of ours who has been a guest of She Talks Peace. And I'm talking about our uh, our fellow peace advocate, a Ukrainian peace activist, uh, Nina Potarska. Nina has been a really big voice advocating for peace conflict resolution and elevating the voices of the vulnerable sectors. She's a woman peace builder. She currently 
works as the Ukraine National Coordinator at the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. If you recall, we interviewed Nina at She Talks Peace, that was episode 26, uh, last February 2022. And uh, this was early days of the podcast. When we talked to Nina, Ukraine had not yet been attacked by Russia, and she talked about her fears for Ukraine. But uh, today, let's uh, revisit Ukraine through Nina's eyes and um, find out what is the reality on the ground level, because I understand it, Nina's daughter is uh, still in uh, Kiev. So hello, hello, Nina. Welcome back to She Talks Peace. Hello, Mina, and nice to be with uh, you. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak for, to your audience. I'm so glad that you're able to uh, join us today, Nina, because your your program, your schedule has been quite hectic. You're now based in Krakow in Poland, and you visit. Um, Kiev and uh, Ukraine regularly, right? Yes, it's a um, main problem in my life that I need this year, last one year and a half, combine my work travels with uh, my personal travels because all my yeah. family now around Europe and uh, in, even uh, in, uh, in uh, Canada. So that's why I'm trying to be in the same time with the uh, with them too. Yeah, your your son is in Ottawa and your daughter is in, in Kiev. Yeah. So tell me, Nina, what does your daughter say? How is she? How is she doing in uh, in Ukraine? She's only twelve years old. You said. I think some uh, some of these ideas a bit weird for people who are far from the war or any kind of conflict, but. Yeah. In everyday life, we like humans, we always face with the with the many challenges and mm -hmm. also with the many emotional ch challenges. And from the May, my daughter decided to go from US together with her father back to Ukraine. And uh, for me, of course, it's better to have my kids in a safe place. And Ukraine, of mm -hmm. course, is not the safest place. In yeah. the world. But uh, in the same time, I, I, I recognize your feelings and your will to be in a community of or be surrounded by friends, to be in the same school as she was before, to be uh, to, to live in her room after one year uh, of uh, traveling around the world because uh, she changed together with uh, other family members. We, uh, she, for example, she started her year in uh, Ukraine for school year, I mean. Uh, then she switched to Poland and we spent half a year in Poland. Then we uh, was asked to join a program in the uh, Czech Republic. So mm -hmm. we had to travel for a couple of months to Czech Republic. And this is, it's been new school, new language, new people around. And then her father was uh, on the, it's not scholarship, it's postdoc program in the uh, in US. So then she switched to US for a couple of months. And then she begging us, just let me go back because I'm tired to be a refugee in these different countries. Mm -hmm. And it's better to be in my, in my room, in my among my friends, and of course, I, I she understand that it's uh, dangerous, but this danger is not every second, mm -hmm. it's time to time, and we are all used to live in the with the idea that our life can end any second, at any second, yeah. But of course, it's better to feel okay when you're uh, among people you know, you love, you feel uh, comfortable and safe. And this is for me and I can, how I can explain for me because I'm also 
tired to be among uh, strangers because of my travelings, because all my mm -hmm. family members in different countries now. And it's important yeah. to feel some warm people who you can hug because these small emotional things make yes. us human. That's right. So, yeah. and for me, it's uh, it's competition between uh, physical safety and emotional and mental safety. Yeah. And I understand that for for my daughter and for teenagers like she is, it's mm -hmm. much more important to be among the friends. That's than right in the safe environment and of course it's difficult for me because the 10 minutes ago i received the air rate alert mm. and it seemed that the level of anxiety <laughs> it's a little bit higher than uh, usual so but i'm trying to think that we cannot control this we cannot control our lives especially when we are in the in the middle of this I even don't know how to find the right word for this because we like a, in an unpredictable situation of absolutely vulnerable situation when we are like humans, we cannot protect ourselves, we cannot protect yeah. our kids. Yeah. And I think it's the biggest thing that, that it's, I'm still facing, uh, it's how I can protect my kids. Yeah, if we, with listening to you talk about uh, the situation of your you know, of your split family and the refugees all over the place it um it brings back memories uh, of the time that um my own family had to be split also you know you, you know that uh, we had a you know liberation front Muslim Liberation Front in in the Philippines fighting for uh, independence, and uh, my home province became a victim of this conflict between the Moro National Liberation Front and uh, our government. And almost fifty years ago, the Moro National Liberation Front occupied uh, our hometown. And uh, the military, in order to get them out, bombed the town, you know. And 80% uh, of, uh, of Polo Sulu was leveled, burned to the ground, completely destroyed, including my home, the homes of my friends and relatives. So a lot of the people that I, was, I grew up with um, became displaced, you know, refugees of, of a sort. And uh, trying to track family members, because I had to be in Manila, just trying to find out what happened to cousins and aunts and grandmother, it makes your heart ache. So when you tell me what's happening with you and worrying about your daughter, it brings back those, uh, those very, very unpleasant memories but nina your your organization the um, women's international league for peace and freedom how how are you managing now providing support for the women in ukraine because uh, you know i gathered that um, support financial support from uh, the united states and the allies uh, has sort of slowed down, largely because of the politics in the United States and now because of the needs of uh, Israel as it wages war against uh, Hamas. How, how are the women of Ukraine doing? It's, it's also mm -hmm. difficult times for us. Uh, from different level, and I, I, I try to explain from all these mm -hmm. perspectives because from the one hand, of course, we are still trying to bring these voices and advocate women's needs on uh, different levels because uh, all talks about future in Ukraine mm -hmm. related to reconstruction uh, and uh, how we can mm -hmm. rebuild. But we are not talking about peace. We are talking mm -hmm. about uh, what we're going to do after we win uh, this mm -hmm. war. But 
Of course, there is mm -hmm. uh, this result of the conflict of the war. It's depend absolutely depend on hundred percent depend on the bonds. And I also can feel and can see this unfair approach towards Ukraine mm -hmm. because if they, I mean, Westerns right, and yeah. Americans and European Union started to help Ukraine immediately with a full mm -hmm. power, but they, yes. all these years, they just fitted us with a small pool yes. just to continue to have the same situation. Yes. And as a result, we're losing people, mm -hmm. we are yes. losing territories to compare mm -hmm. with the with the beginning and the, with the position of mm -hmm. Ukraine in the beginning of the conflict. Mm -hmm. So the Russians occupied yes. several regions of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And in the same time, people are exhausted. Yes. Uh, combatants near the front line, they are exhausted because for men in Ukraine, mm -hmm. it's just one way. So we, we can divide them on the people who are already in the army, or who are waiting for mobilization mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's like mandatory. It, it, all men from 18 to 60 have to be in the army. But mm -hmm. of course, many of them have different duties and of course mm -hmm. even family duties because some members of my family, they are care, taking care about uh, disabled people. So mm -hmm. in that, he, if you be in, in, on, in the army, who will care about these people? So it's uh, affects many different groups, but in the same time, my friends yes. and my uh, yes. relatives who are already in the army one year and a half, they are absolutely exhausted because yes. it's and you can mm -hmm. you imagine because war in Ukraine because Ukraine right. in a, yes. in, in a Western Europe and it's mean that we have real winter with a mm -hmm. minus 30, minus 35. Of course, mm -hmm. during the cold time, cold period, all these guys in the front line, mm -hmm. under the rain, under the snow, in the, in, the, in the frost. And of course, it's affect they mentally and physically. And I even don't know who, uh, from uh, people who I know, had, had no connection with the, with the people on the front line. So we all have somebody, friends or relatives who are in the army yeah. and nina now more and more women are uh, yeah. joining the, yeah. uh, the military yeah. at the front it, more than it, uh, more than five thousand women are now yeah. Yeah. in the military yeah. as combatants yes and i have my women friends uh, who are combatants and of course now they are uh, talking about like how they are tired after after one year and a half being in a front line without any they don't know where uh, when it's possible to end or when they can back home or even when they can back home and be in a safe in a safe or sleeping in a safe place so mm -hmm. one year and a half it's it's too much yeah and from the front line it's just two ways how you can go out of this you can die or you can be disabled and disable as serious disability because it's mean that you are not able to join army again. Mm -hmm. And of course, all these situation demotivate whole society. And as, of course, even the uh, with, with the help of uh, financial help from uh, US, it means that if they stop this help, we have to normalize this idea that we're losing these territories forever but that's and unacceptable right nina that's completely unacceptable to, to for, a, for a big amount for biggest amount of so the mood is divided between like we need peace to mm -hmm. save our lives and lives of our relatives and friends and another one idea that if we agree for this peace from the occupation it means that we never back to our homes we right. all these victims of or of the war was mm -hmm. for nothing for nothing yes 
more yes, than 600 yes. days of, of suffering, of warfare, for nothing. Yes, I, I, can, I, can, I can feel what you're, what you're saying, Nina. But the mood in, in Ukraine now, among your friends, among, among the women, I think it's the how do they say how, how do they see the, the the way forward Nina what do they think realistically should be done so that you can reclaim the peace that you've had for for so long before Russia uh, came I, into the future I think it's impossible to feel or think in realistic when you are ah. inside of Ukraine Mm -hmm. And I feel it, and I can feel uh, according my own moods. Because mm -hmm. if I'm, for example, in Ottawa, I can see the war from the distance, and of course, yeah. I can understand from the geopolitical point of view. But if you are inside of Ukraine, if you're suffering every day, if you are facing these challenges, if you are always on the phone calls with your relatives and uh, you, uh, friends who are in the contact line. Of course, it's a different demands from this part of society. And of course, they want to, all oh, people who can be together with you and fighting with you uh, for your territory, for your freedom, for your values, because it's in some way we are also, we lost our values too because mm -hmm. ukraine before was more it was like freedom democracy country that's but, right i mean you were you were celebrated for the way that you you know protected your democratic space went out into the streets to reclaim democracy yeah. so you that's you right. were you were so brave and after that to be where you are now i can i can understand how you feel nina and it's 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 difficult because I used to live in the freedom country, mm -hmm. but of course now after the war, after the moves inside of society, it's different. And of course, it's many divisions in this inside of society, and people are tired, people are frustrated, people are angry, and they need to relieve this angerness. And and of course, uh, this. Community not same as as was it before the war. I don't know how how we can rebuild the same mm. after or how many years we need to to have the same. Of course, it's impossible because mm -hmm. I, I it's a generation. We need one generation at least to forgot this uh, hate and to to feel uh, or to comfort this angriness towards uh, people who destroyed our life. Mm -hmm. Because of course I understand and I have a friend from, who are human rights defenders uh, from Russia or who are researchers uh, or sociologists uh, from Russia. And we're trying to build or re renew and rebuild our relationship. But sometimes for me it's difficult and I'm always trying to think that they are not guilty by their own. And I'm, I'm always trying to be on this uh, human level communication because it's very easy to go into the hate, hate during the war. And I, my, my plan, to, it's like minimum plan, which mm -hmm. I want to have after this war, it just saved my soul from the hate and have my eyes and my mind open. Yeah. Not but Nina, well, you know, I I applaud you for um, trying to keep the hate out of your heart, but it must be so difficult when you watch, you know, interviews with ordinary Russian citizens and they continue to support Putin because they really believe, I guess that's because Russia controls the media, right? The propaganda machinery of the government is is so uh, strong that they believe that it was Ukraine that started the war. I mean, up to now, Nina, the, the ordinary Russian still believes that, right? 
Yes, and it's it's one year ago. I was on the conference together with a guy from uh, his professor from uh, Saint Petersburg, and uh, he started his speech from the very weird word as for me. It is that we have to do this. We have to do this to to protect our like country and way of our living. So, but against uh, U.S. But why you are fighting with U.S. on the Ukrainian territory? That's right. Okay, you can fight, but somewhere uh, in the, or maybe on U.S. territory or or in uh, Russia. And in the same time, of course, it's uh, we we understand this geopolitical game, and of course, mm -hmm. all these wars they are caused because of uh, many different reasons. Mm -hmm which related to territory, to access to the sea, to access to the transportation corridors uh, around the world. But, right. Uh, right. and of course it's related to the money, and of course it's related who is a first country in the world, who is a second, who is uh, who can control uh, which resources in this world. But I don't know how we are, how it's possible or because, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago in my mind it was difficult to even imagine how it's possible to prove your financial interest mm -hmm. in the war mm -hmm. but now it's like uh, these all parties of big play gamer g gamers there forgot that before we had the rules some rules even mm -hmm. how we can do in these wars but now they can shell in uh, Ukrainian cities. They can destroy these cities. No rules. And now again, we, we can see what is uh, going on in Gaza. And where is the humanity? Where, how we even, right. even we are trying to ref, make, making any reference to humanity? They they blaming us like uh, you are stupid. You are you are not understand that we have to do this because there is no any way to deal with this uh, problem. So how it was possible and how it's possible. That's true, yeah. You know, sometimes um, when I listen to the propaganda coming from Russia, I really cannot understand how the ordinary Russian citizen could buy the propaganda that's coming out of the, the state. So how, how can one believe that a country like Ukraine, which is so small compared to Russia, which had a military really tiny compared to the Russian military you know, uh, forces, how could they possibly think that Ukraine would want to initiate any kind of a war against Russia, what they do, they do believe it. And Nina, you and your uh, your network, you do still have contact with civil, you know, whatever civil society is left uh, uh, among the Russian uh, population. Are you able to at least show them the mirror and showing the truth about what the reality is in Ukraine and the war with uh, with Russia? I think the main idea of the propaganda and uh, especially like Russian propaganda, because they are like the best, I think, in this world. Oh, yeah. With the propaganda. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. all these are rooted to the fear, different kind of fears. And mm. when I'm trying to talk to these people, Mm -hmm. I just use this very easy approach I'm, and I'm trying to find the, what kind of fear this idea rooted. Mm -hmm. Because I still believe that all people in this world want to live in the peace. But sometimes, sometimes I don't know why, they thinking there about we can reach peace through the war. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think it's the main mistake. Because it's impossible to go to the war and reach peace. That's right, yeah. And this idea is very popular now. And I don't know how it's how we can 
even reduce the influence of this idea because mm -hmm. everywhere in the world people are talking about like for to protect ourselves we need to use another one power another power so mm -hmm. power one power against another power and this is like a stairs of escalation and yeah. the, i'm really afraid that in the next year we will we will have something more terrible for all of this work I pray uh, constantly, Nina, that uh, your situation is going to get better, uh, hoping against hope that some pressure could be forced on, on the Russian state to push uh, President Putin to accepting uh, you know, the reality that he cannot take the regions of Ukraine that he wants without losing so much. But um, given, uh, the, given the state of the, of the world today, I know that um, you just have to continue to bear whatever is thrown your way. The women of Ukraine have to, uh, you know, just strengthen their backbone and continue helping where, where they can. Nina, before we go, I was just wondering about the uh, the role of women now in Ukraine. I know that they are joining the military to defend their state, but in terms of the uh, the efforts within within the state, uh, the decision making, the uh, discussions about what the future would be when you know thinking about. Uh, reparations, thinking about rehabilitation. Are the women becoming more and more part of the conversation? I mean, essentially, is the women peace and security agenda being supported in, in Ukraine? Now we are trying to organize uh, roundtables and mm -hmm. uh, among feminists and uh, human rights defenders to uh, formulate our uh, advocacy agenda about how we can bring these voices into the reconstruction and reconciliation and uh, everything related to the decision-making process in mm -hmm. about future in Ukraine. And I think it's a biggest problem for us because many of them are uh, burnout because mm. all this one year and a half, women activists replace this social sphere or social duties or mm -hmm. reproductive labor, I mean, care work, first of all. Because many women organizations during in the, from the beginning of the war, they started to be like a humanitarian organization. Right. Because, uh, and they replace these humanitarian organizations and government sector who uh, i mean social sector and even now for them it's difficult to concentrate on their own needs and their own uh, demands like uh, women activists or feminists mm -hmm. and i think it's a, it's a it's a very dangerous place when we have women who are already exhausted and mm -hmm. we need to engage them and encourage them to continue doing something. And in the same time, it's a general problem because it's uh, it's how we are living in, in Ukraine uh, before. So we, at least we I want to help them to, to continue being or continue uh, doing what, uh, what they do. Yeah. And uh, because of this, now we are trying to focus our grants and programs on uh, on even the retreat centers for them when they can spend time maybe one two weeks just to live two weeks in a quiet place where they can live sleep and uh, bring you there uh, straight to to bed mm. again to Ukraine yeah because of the burnout. By the way, Nina, okay, this is a, a practical question, Nina. How do you and uh, the women of Ukraine, how do you deal with burnout? 
what do you do to push away depression? I, I ask this because there are so many of our friends and networks in the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership who are in the same situation. And, on a, and when you are faced like you are on a daily basis with war and hardship, you have to do something, right, to keep the depression at bay. What do you do, Nina? Do you bake a cake? Do you uh, sing a song? Yes, all of this, all of this, because I uh, I have uh, psychotherapy every every week. Mm -hmm. I have a uh, singing class, vocal class every week. Good for you, Nina. <laughs> yeah, and I have uh, yoga two times a week online because oh, yeah. I travel and uh, I, I I have these uh, yoga classes, and uh, I'm also trying to be. Uh, I work out uh, every two three times per week because just to reduce this stress inside of me. So to uh, and if I have no opportunity to for mm -hmm. workout, I'm just walking around maybe one two hours with a lecture or with a uh, music just mm -hmm. to reduce this level of stress because of course it's I have my personal circumstances to right. be in stress and of course because we are doing a interview and in deep interview for our researchers and we talking to people in a, in a terrible situations mm -hmm. and I need time to to understand and to accept and then to relieve so because of this, I decided to pay more attention on my ability to live in this and be open for these mm -hmm. uh, bad emotions too. Mm -hmm. Because it's all these emotions, it's a part of our life. So I cannot be just open for something good. I, I want to be open and able to contain something bad too. Mm -hmm. And of course, the idea that uh, we are like guests on this mm -hmm. world and we need to live every second and then postpone any ideas or any feelings. And you want to say somebody you love these people or you want mm -hmm. to say something beautiful to anybody, you can say it immediately because maybe tomorrow doesn't exist. Yeah. That is true. And I'm really glad that you are focusing on, on yourself, on your mental and emotional well-being. Because if you allow the depression to just you know, overwhelm you, then I cannot imagine, Nina, how you, you would continue to do the, the very, very exhausting work that you're doing. Now, before we leave, Nina, uh, perhaps you take this opportunity to send uh, a message to our listeners and uh, who knows, maybe it might find its way to the powers that be who are making decisions about the support for Ukraine. If you could talk to the United States leaders and the Western leaders, Nina, what would your message be on behalf of the women and children of Ukraine? You know, sometimes I feel it's too late, too late to fix this situation. Mm. But in the same time, I feel a lot of envy to, mm -hmm. towards the guys who let this situation be. Mm -hmm. I can suggest them never use these double standards mm -hmm. towards any situation because if they are power in this world i mean these countries not just us all these countries who are main power in this world it's also responsibility and they need to use this responsibility in the right way mm -hmm. because countries like ukraine we are depend always uh, be depend on the other countries biggest mm -hmm. countries and of course uh, we can fight we can try to survive we can do whatever it's possible to do but of course we depend on them on 100 percent 
So it's their responsibility. It just it's not mean that they are guilty, but but of course, mm -hmm. from my perspective, they are guilty all because mm -hmm. they let this situation to be. Yeah, yeah, I, I can understand the, uh, your feeling. I mean, when I look back at the flow of aid, for instance, from the West to Ukraine, if they had given everything during the first half of uh, of the war then ukraine would be in a very different position now but instead you know they give some uh, this month and then a little more in six months so it, you know it's sometimes it's like uh, a too little too late but it's anyway late. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's too so late. yeah please continue but let's hope it, that it's not uh, too late. The, the will of the Ukrainians uh, still holding a strong between your president, your, your first lady, Madame Zelensky, the women of Ukraine, the fighting men of Ukraine. We see the will of a people who want to protect their family, their society, and their liberty at all costs. And I echo your, your hope that uh, the West and the Allies would step up and uh, not forget that they are fighting, they're helping you fight for democracy of the world. It's not just, it's not just the democracy or the territory of Ukraine. That's at stake here, but you're, you are, in, in other words, this is a proxy war, right, uh, Nina? They're, they're fighting Russia for everybody else who wants to be part of a democratic world. So, my dear listeners, you heard our friend uh, Nina Kotarska talk to us about the realities today in Ukraine. A year, more than a year after um, she first voiced her hopes that Russia would be reasonable and, and uh, not invade. Well, they did invade. And um, Nina's hopes for, for her people. Nina, I hope that um, your optimism that you had expressed in February 2022 will resurface <laughs> because at the end of the day that core of optimism is going to serve you and the women activists in in good stead so thank you so much nina for joining us today on the she talks peace so dear listeners this is uh, amina rasul of the philippine center for islam and democracy saying join us again for another episode of As She Talks Peace. And uh, don't forget to follow us on uh, Twitter, on Instagram. And if you have some suggestions or you would like to reach our friend Nina Potarska, do send us a message at uh, She Talks Peace Podcast at gmail.com. So again, thank you so much, Nina. And bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. She Talks Peace is brought to you in partnership with Podcast Network Asia and Podmetrics, the easiest way to monetize your podcast. For more information, check out their website at podcastnetwork.asia and podmetrics.co. The views and opinions expressed by the podcast creators, hosts, and guests do not necessarily reflect the official policy and position of Podcast Network Asia, the hosts of the program, or other programs of the network. Any content provided by the people on the podcast are of their own opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything.